Before we come to the Scripture reading this morning, on behalf of the elders, I want to take just a few moments to address the tragic events that unfolded at our Capitol on Wednesday. Now, before I make those comments, let me just say that I suspect I will say some things that some here may disagree with. And I understand that. I just would say this. I challenge you to do what Luke said about the Bereans, that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica who searched the Scriptures to see if these things were so. So I just ask for you to interact with what I share with you, not on the cultural basis or political basis, but on a biblical basis. As we watched what happened on Wednesday, I think many of us anyway were profoundly saddened by that violent attack because it was an assault not merely against the results of a single election or a national landmark. It was in a very real sense an attack against the nation. I will be honest with you, I fear that the actions of a few may provide precedent in years to come that will mar future transitions of power, something that is utterly destructive in a democracy like ours. Those who committed these acts should be brought to justice, should bear the full weight of their crimes. But at the same time, it's important for us to acknowledge that it is not just those who entered the Capitol who are responsible for this national tragedy. Their actions were fueled by reckless, divisive rhetoric. Public officials on both sides of the aisle, including our president, and millions of our citizens who have posted and reposted angry, incendiary accusations on social media for years, all of them share alike responsibility for what transpired. And they bear responsibility for the fruit of their words. We understand that legally as well as biblically. If you walk into a building and cry fire, you are responsible for the outcome of those words. But how should we as Christians respond to these tragic events. I know you know this, but let me just say that for all of us, we have to take off our hats as American citizens, and we have to think first and foremost as followers of Jesus Christ. That is where our first allegiance lies. And so that's how we need to address this. So that's what I want to do. Again, if you disagree with me, that's fine. Just do so biblically and and search the Scriptures to see where you can argue with these points. First of all, I think we as Christians must respond to what happened on Wednesday with sorrow, not celebration. As we learned in Romans 13, followers of Jesus Christ are not permitted to engage in rebellion against our authorities. Romans 13.1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, if you were here when I taught through Romans 13, you know that I didn't take a simplistic view of this. There are legitimate ways to take issue with things that are done illegal in our country and world. Go back and listen to the very first message I did on Romans 13 where I dealt with those issues. So, I'm not suggesting a Pollyannic approach to government. This, however, is what the Scriptures teach. We are to obey the laws of our government. We are to honor its officials in our attitudes and words. We are even told to use cultural gestures that show appropriate respect for those in authority. Now, folks, let's just be honest. If we as Christians are told that we may not engage in rebellion That also means that it is never appropriate that we should celebrate the rebellion of others. So instead of applauding the things that happened, as some have done, Christians should be grieved that these people have disobeyed their Creator by rebelling against the the authorities that He has established and not using the means that Scripture itself prescribes for appealing when there are injustices. Secondly, we should respond with confirmed truth, not conspiracy theories. It saddens me that so many Christians believe and pass on 
rampant conspiracy theories. Let me say it as frankly as I can. Biblical Christianity is inherently inconsistent with conspiracy theories. Why is that? Because of the standard of justice that God Himself lays down in His Word. To establish personal guilt, God demands that there be witnesses and not merely evidence. There was false evidence raised against Christ at His trial. There must be the kind of evidence that will stand up in court, not the suspicions and conjectures circulated on social media. If you believe and pass along conspiracy theories that accuse people of crimes without the kind of evidence that God demands, I don't see any way around it but that you are sinning against that person and against the Lord. Because to believe, post, or repost such accusations is to bear false witness and violates the ninth commandment. Exodus 20 verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Thirdly, our response should be justice, not partiality. God never shows partiality in judgment. Romans 2.11 is one such statement. There is no partiality with God. And in context, it's talking about in the execution of judgment. God never alters His assessment of wrongdoing based on the color of a person's skin, the size of their bank account, the power of their influence, or their political party. And He expects the same of us who are His children. If it's wrong, it's wrong, whether it's in your party or the other party. And it's never legitimate for Christians to use the excuse, well, they did it first. Listen, you don't even tolerate that from your children. And God doesn't tolerate that from us either. We should be for true justice, assigning wrong where it belongs, regardless of whose side. Fourth, we should respond with faith, not fear. The events of the last couple of months, combined with the the pandemic, have produced fear. Fear in the hearts of many Christians. Perhaps you are fearful as a result of what's happened this week. Listen, I understand that temptation. I would have to admit that next to the 1960s, these are the most unsettled times in my lifetime. So how should you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, respond to this kind of trouble? I love Psalm 112, verse 7. The righteous will not fear evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. If you're tempted to fear, remind yourself that you trust in one who has not changed. God, as we just sang, is the ancient of days. He sits on his throne. He has, as Daniel records, a plan that he is working out throughout human history, including the affairs of our own country. So trust in the Lord. He hasn't changed. His character hasn't changed. His eternal plan hasn't changed. His love for you, believer, hasn't changed. So respond with faith, not with fear. We should also respond finally in hope, not despair. The serious problems in our country have led some, frankly, to despair, fearing all kinds of impending, looming disaster. You know, I'm not a prophet. I can't promise you that none of those disasters will come. But whatever comes, I can promise you this. God will still be God. He will still be your source of strength. He will still be your source of joy. He will still be your everything. He will be your hope. Read the book of Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk, the prophet, struggled. He struggled with the fact that a, a wicked people were going to come and attack his nation, and his nation was going to be completely destroyed. And he struggled with that. How could God allow that to happen? And you see his struggle back and forth between faith and doubt throughout that little book of Habakkuk. But here's how he ends, and this is how we should end. This is Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and following. Now remember as I read this, we're talking about an agricultural society where the, the crops were everything. 
He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and made me walk on my high places. Listen, don't respond to what's going on around us with despair. Respond in hope. That's your God. He is your hope, and that, brothers and sisters, will never change. So think about these things. Meditate on them. Test me against the Scripture, but I think these are ways we need to consider responding to what has unfolded this past week.